All right, so I'll get started. Uh, people are still joining and um, I'll spend the first two minutes or three talking about TransTech Boulder chapter and what we're up to. Um, and so hopefully everybody's joined by the time we come back to Scott and start the presentation. So if everybody's okay there, um, let's see. So for those of you, if anybody is new to TransTech in this group, which I haven't seen any new names so far, um, but uh, the organization is a global organization. The mission is to move, uh, in, in, in a nutshell, move a billion people into a state of well-being and flourishing by the year 2030. And the way we do that is through a, a truly a global community, um, and a, what, by which I always say not just the U.S. and Canada, but truly global. We have um, Taya online, I know, from uh, Slovenia today. So uh, we, we set this up as 11 a.m. to try to get uh, some of the European, Middle East, and African members to be able to call in, and we have some of them today. Um, and it's uh, all about uh, mental wellness, emotional well-being, and human flourishing, leveraging a lot of technology and science uh, innovation that's happening. And so the categories there you can see, uh, ranging from neuroscience and psychology to the actual tech components like sensors and virtual reality, artificial intelligence, uh, which all have uh, you know, broad applicability, but uh, interesting uh, novel applications in the, in the mental health space. And so we're, we're excited about that. The organization itself has, operates a, a, a series of, there's more than 50 chapters. And so Transcend Boulder is just one of those. And um, also runs an annual conference. And the third major thing is runs an annual um, accelerator program for startups in the space. And they have quite an audience of uh, investors and advisors who participate in that accelerator program. And so one of our priorities right now in Colorado is to find startups who are interested in participating in that accelerator. That's, uh, the date is not exact yet, but it's usually early September starts. So um, we're now recruiting actively to find companies that want to want to play. And um, so please email me at that address if you are or know a startup that is interested. And what we want to do then locally is, it, since it's a virtual online accelerator anyway, the program itself will be run out of the Palo Alto uh, location. But we will try to get a local set of advisors, investors, um, mentors to participate um, offline and help the local folks to get a little better, uh, get, get more out of the accelerator program. So all that's happening right now. Please do get in touch if you're interested. Um, this one I just came in my inbox this morning. So one of the great things about TransTech globally is we, a lot of opportunities come across our, our radar. And this one just literally came in, was flagged by TransTech today. Joy Ventures is an investment, kind of a boutique investment bank in California, focused on the TransTech area. And so they have put out a call because they have an active academic program to fund research in the space. So there's a link there. Um, you can grab a screenshot there if you're interested, if you come from the academic side. Which is an interesting thing about TransTech, I think, in terms of the membership, is that when, you know, we're, we're heavy on startups and, and sort of the entrepreneurial aspect, but we also, um, because it's uh, healthcare, there's a strong academic component, strong medical research community that is interested in seeing their, their research turned into, you know, either products or, or services to uh, customers that need them. So uh, this tends to happen pretty often. Uh, and then just very quickly, we do have the next uh, two events scheduled in July. And, you know, normally July, um, summertime, you slow down these kinds of series. But I think so far there's an appetite for at least into July having some events. Um, and so again, these will be online, but um, one on BCI technology where a couple of companies, Wavi is a medical uh, uh, EEG headset uh, came out of the University of Colorado Research and is now a standalone company based in Denver. Um, and then Muse, the, uh, which I think a lot of people know, the, the, one of the first consumer headsets with EEG sensors uh, used a lot in meditation. They're based in Toronto, but their, um, their most recent acquisition was a company in Boulder, Colorado called uh, uh, Meditation Studio and was a, a kind of a set of a library of guided meditations. And so because Muse's 
business model is very focused on the meditation community, uh, it was a natural fit. So a couple of companies with Colorado roots or, or origins. And then uh, also that month is, uh, not, we don't have an exact time here yet, but um, uh, a researcher at the University, uh, Colorado State University is working on virtual reality in terms of both assessing and treating uh, brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries. So really interesting application and technology there. So that's what's going on. Um, give me a second to just double check my cast of characters here. And um, we'll get started. Um, okay, great. So Scott, we have, I've, I've got, if you can see the participants, we've got 15 online. Uh, I think some still joining. So. Uh, this will be a good crowd, and I will uh, turn the slides over to Scott. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. Scott, you go ahead and load yours up while I introduce you. So Scott Brown is a, a veteran entrepreneur. Um, he's been on kind of all sides of, of the business community. He's been a, a founder and a CEO. He's been uh, an advisor. Um, I met him because he worked at an R&D consortium called Cable Labs in Louisville, Colorado, where I worked some years ago. And he came in after me and was actually instrumental in sort of changing what that organization did um, away from sort of conventional uh, corporate research to a, a startup mentality and an innovation mentality. And he kind of created that program over the course of a few years. And now he's kind of come full circle and he's back as, as a founder and CEO of uh, Immersion. And so welcome, Scott. Start whenever you're ready. Thanks, John. Oh, it's great to be here, everybody. Great to see all these uh, interested, exciting people here this morning. Uh, as Don said, I'm Scott. Um, we're going to spend just a few minutes kind of going through some pictures and talking about immersion and brain state and how we measure it through peripheral physiology. Um, we actually have the ability for everybody to join in and I could measure your brain during this session here today. So if you've got an Apple Watch or a Samsung Galaxy smartwatch or one of those Fitbit smartwatches, you can go to this link or snap a picture of this QR code and actually load it up on your smartwatch while we talk. Um, so at any point I can come back to this, but uh, if you got it your phone and want to snap a picture of it right now, you're welcome to. Okay, so hey, I'm Scott. Uh, as Don said, nine-time startup founder, six wins, one catastrophic fail, one zombie that refuses to die. Um, I've spent uh, the last five years running venture capital on behalf of the global cable and broadband industry uh, out of a, an outfit called Cable Labs, as Don mentioned, and really helped to bring that organization into a new focus on startup innovation and uh, was lucky enough a few years ago to meet Paul Zak, who is our founder here at Immersion. And we'll talk about his story as we go along. My contact details are here. Feel free to reach out to me anytime. This is a really interesting and compelling space and we wanna help support all entrepreneurs uh, in this TransTech Boulder community. So if there's ever anything that I can do to help, please feel free to reach out. So let's get into it. At Immersion, we measure what the world loves. Our customers, like many of the logos you see on the screen here and others, predict market outcomes with uncanny accuracy, especially when the cost of being wrong is really high. And that's an important distinction. So you all know that neuroscience traditionally has been hard, right? It's expensive, it's difficult, uh, cumbersome. And the data insight we get from human beings today typically fall into two categories. It's what people say or what people can afford. And too often ignores what actually makes us people. So Immersion is a distributed neuroscience SaaS platform that can directly measure second by second what an audience's brain truly values using the smartwatch or fitness sensors that they already own. The reason this is so important is that people lie 
I mean, not on purpose, right? I mean, people aren't malicious, but typically we use things like surveys or focus groups or dial testing, or we, we ask people to self-report what they think or feel about an experience. And what that's really doing is it's measuring the human bias in the brain, not what the brain truly values. We get answers based on that bias. And when we base decisions on that, we're only right at best 30% of the time. And you can imagine all the big decisions we make as people, as companies, are typically based on that self-report, on gut feel. And so 65% of the TV shows that are released this year are going to be canceled in the next 12 months. 90% of the songs on Spotify have only ever been listened to by the band and their mom. Same thing is true in gaming, and it goes on and on and on. When we make big decisions based on what people say they like, more often than not, we're wrong. But the brain doesn't lie. So our founders, Paul and George, spent 20 years doing academic research funded by DARPA and the CIA to figure out how to predict future human behavior based on this unique brain state we call immersion and measured using peripheral physiology. So that's the high level. Let's actually see it. And then we'll set the frame and we can talk a little bit more about the science. So this is the platform right here. I'm gonna play a movie trailer. In this particular demo, we've got 35 people who are using their Apple Watch, um, watching this movie trailer all at once. And this little blue line you can see is measuring immersion, which is a state of high attention and high emotional resonance, second by second, over time. And we track a, a number of interesting metrics across the top here. The awesome index is really your go no go signal. The closer that is to 100, the more likely that people are going to act based on this content. Wow factor is measuring the height and width of these peaks. Blah is looking at neurological frustration. So you can see that right here. Our purple line, this particular human brain is really turned on by this Marvel uh, content. But this teal color, that person is not. And you could see about one minute into the trailer, they all dropped off. So that is the neurological frustration happening right there. The other interesting metric that we measure is actually psychological safety. We're the only tool uh, that exists right now that can predict and accurately measure psychological safety directly from the brain. And so as we see this trailer start to come to a close, we start to see a handful of peaks for these humans again. We had a 30 second dip in this particular content, but yet it spiked closer to the end. So the trick with a movie trailer, it's the number one driver of opening weekend box office. And so this 30 second gap in the trailer probably had a significant impact on that opening weekend. If they would have known this before they released this trailer, they could recut it to make sure that they have some peak moments inside this 30 seconds so people don't change the channel, so people can actually find out when the movie is going to be released. So second by second, measuring attention and emotional resonance using an Apple Watch. That's the key. Today we support all of these smartwatch platforms and soon the smart ring like an Aura and otherwise. We also support direct fitness sensors like a Skosh or a Wahoo and other sensors that people use today. All right, so that's what it is. That's kind of how it works. You've seen this thing in action a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the how and the science behind all of this. So this is Dr. Paul Zak. 20 years ago, uh, he started doing research on oxytocin and its effect on future human behavior. He's the founder of neuroeconomics, the most cited researcher in neuroscience in the world, best-selling author. You've probably seen his TED talk about trust and oxytocin. About five years into his research, he got a phone call from the CIA and DARPA. 
And they said, you know, all this work on oxytocin, that's pretty interesting, but um, could you do it in reverse? If we showed you a flyer that we drop in Afghanistan that we know works, could you help tell us why? And could you find a way to measure that somewhere in the battlefield? So you, you can't roll an MRI machine. You can't roll, you know, a 200 dot EEG out into the desert. You've got to find a way to measure and predict future human behavior on flyers in the desert. Well, it was an interesting problem. It took them 12 years to figure out how to do it. And so when people experience the world, as you all know, their brain is always working. And what Dr. Zach discovered is that the brain is responding to this uh, activity second by second, millisecond by millisecond, and it has this state of high attention and high emotion. And when those two things align, your brain codes those memories in a different way. So you think of it as um, when you got married or the birth of a child or 9-11, high attention, high emotional resonance codes those memories differently in your brain. And it turns out that as that happens, it sends signals down through your body in the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And from that, Paul and the team were able to figure out by using all of these medical devices and blood draws and laser beams and EEGs and MRIs and all of those tool sets, he was able to figure out what to listen for between people's heartbeats in order to identify the human brain's approach and retreat from this state of immersion. And once he figured out what to listen for, and knew where to find it in the body, he was then able to apply it to economic behavior. He could predict things like um, buying and selling and sharing and downloading and um, the contributions to nonprofit organizations. And because DARPA and the CIA said you needed to do it anywhere, anytime, they found a way to do it through fitness sensors and uh, devices like an Apple Watch. So this is the base algorithm. This is all we do. We measure attention plus emotional resonance, convert that second by second into a number we call immersion, which is on a scale between zero and 10. And we track that as things go along. Now I'm a startup guy. I'm not a scientist. I'm not a neuroscientist by training. And typically um, when you do see a startup deck from uh, any startup in the world, they have numbers on it. And, and you know, nine times out of 10, those numbers are bullshit. What I love about what Paul and the team have developed over the last few years is that everything we see on this slide is peer reviewed published science. Their ability to use immersion to predict TV ratings or music purchases or downloads or uh, long term memory and information recall. This is all published and, uh, and reviewed science that you can find online today. It's pretty remarkable, the ability to tie immersion, that state of attention and emotional resonance directly to advertising sales or directly to music hits. And so when we look at the market today, we look at it in two groups, one, on the content side, we know that we can quantify the human brain's unconscious emotional response to an experience and then predict future behavior based on that content. But we also have a group of people using that smartwatch that are experiencing that content. And from that, we can identify those people who are super fans, the, the top 10% of the people who are emotionally engaged with this content. And when you think about TVs, movies, or music, that's incredibly valuable. That's your new market, right? Without immersion, no one would have ever predicted that a, a country music rap song would be popular with women between 18 and 25. And yet here we are. The reverse is also true. We can identify those people who are maybe there in the room, but frankly, just don't care. 
right? Those who are neurologically frustrated or, or not interested in this content at all. And when you know your super fans in the reverse, then you can do really interesting things with those groups. You can choose who to talk to, and you can provide those who have disconnected different types of content to bring them into the fold. Today, CBS uses us to select pilots to invest in, but also to edit content moment by moment. They know that immersion uh, as it scoops just before a commercial break will keep people over that two and a half minutes coming back for more after that commercial break. And what we found in our initial study with them was that only about 40% of commercial breaks uh, were led into with high levels of immersion. That means that 60% of the time they were leaving money on the table and encouraging people to change the channel. And now using our platform moment by moment, they can craft the brain's response to that content. Accenture, uh, the large consulting firm, they spend a billion dollars a year training their own employees. And for them, they use immersion to measure and predict the success of their internal training programs. How do you know that education and training actually works? Because we have a direct tie to long-term memory and can predict future behavior, Accenture saw our platform as an easy and unique way to measure the efficacy of training for the first time. Electrolux is a classic marketing play. The difference with them is that they sell their refrigerators and dishwashers to Home Depot and Home Depot sells to actual consumers like you and I. And so at Electrolux, they use our platform to measure the sales experience a place where neuroscience has never been able to go before because you can't roll 35 MRI machines into Home Depot, but you can certainly find 35 secret shoppers to walk in with their Apple Watch and measure and predict that sales experience. People like Bishop McCann and Merritt and others use us to measure both virtual and live experiences and events like sales meetings and franchisee meetings and team meetings all over the world today. So that's immersion, where neuroscience is a service with a subscription model that allows anyone to use neuroscience anywhere, anytime, no PhDs required, immediate insights, neuroscience for everyone. Now what I'll do, if I can, if my screen is still up here, let me just flip back and see. I actually turned this on, my watch is, uh, is running right now. You can see, let's see if we can get a shot of it here. Um, that's me being measured in real time. You can see, whoop, I just had that little pop as I was talking. And you can see that data being fed to our system right here. This was the start of the meeting. I flagged it. And you can see as I'm talking, there's mm -hmm. these peaks and valleys along the way. Hey, oh, you're not Scott, seeing I'm it? I'm not sure we can see that. We see a slide. Oh, okay. Hold on one second. Let me try sharing my screen again. Let's do this. OK, can go. you see the screen now? OK, cool. Let's do this. So you could see, here's my Apple Watch. Let's see if we get, a, get it to focus here a second. There we go. Of course, there. All right, you can see a couple of those spikes happening just as I start talking and we start to see this thing on the screen here. And then if we go back to the web view, you can see we're seeing real-time, second-by-second neuroscience in action. And this number is that average immersion score that's happening across the entire event. And so if it was more than just me connected in, then we'd be able to see individual people and how they're responding to this content in real time. And you can make that go, no-go decision based on this number. Now, what I'll do here is I'm gonna stop this event so when I finish it and then hit complete, we're going to see a couple of things happen. The numbers start to show up here on this web view. 
But if we go, let me clear out of that, and I'm going to go back to my watch here. You can see I, I get that awesome index right here on the watch, as well as all my other numbers, and I can see how I responded compared to the rest of the group. Now, this is personal information that's only available to me. Um, the actual running of the event can't separate that out, except anonymously. And so the, uh, the users themselves are all in here with anonymized codes and device IDs, not individual names or email addresses. We can see across this uh, meeting so far, we had a great awesome index, which means that, you know, at least for me, I was really grooving on this conversation. Good levels of wow factor, which is pretty great. Not a whole lot of blah, so I wasn't very neurologically frustrated, although there might have been something that happened right in here about 30 minutes into our conversation, uh, or about 15 minutes in, it looks like, because it started at that dot there. And then psychological safety was pretty good. I, I'm feeling great about this conversation. From that, we can make obvious and easy decisions on the content or the experience and uh, uh, change it up for future. So that's what we got. It's neuroscience democratized for everybody, um, works anywhere, anytime using the devices that people already have. Let me just stop there for a minute and uh, um, see if there are any questions or ideas or comments or things that uh, you're dying to ask. Is there any that way to get sort of an email confirmation or um, just... An email confirmation of what, sorry? Of um, this conversation and just given that I don't have anything, um, I haven't received anything previously or... I don't need that. I wouldn't be able to send you an email com uh, confirmation, but the yep. note that I'm going to make on your case is permanent. Okay. Um, and it will be for. I think. Um... Sorry about that. <laughs> Somebody's multitasking. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, I think I've unmuted everyone except for that person. Um, Rick, are you on? Can um, you hear me? Yeah, Scott, yeah. Um, a couple of questions. First of all, um, really interesting stuff. Um, the, the first question I had was um, the example you gave, the example you started with, with the movie trailer and the sort of the, the patterns. Um, yeah. One of the things that struck me, and I, I do a lot of stuff in the behavioral science world, is the, the concept of the peak end rule and how it affects mm, yeah. people's memories um, and yeah. also the notion of overload. So I'm wondering sort of in the example, don't you want both peaks and valleys, but then to end strongly if what you really want somebody to do is wander away with a really strong positive memory? That's right. Right. That peak end rule is so important. You absolutely are going to have that. And one of the things we know is that the human brain is a bit like a rubber band. You're never going to see something go up to 10 and just stay there, right? The, the human brain is going to go up and down and stretch around, and you're going to have lots of peaks and valleys over time, and that's okay. If you want to create a behavior-changing experience, then you want more peaks than valleys, and you want those peaks to correspond with things that are important for the future behavior, like brand names or logos or dates or times, things that people will remember. Um, too often what we see is that we architect stories and experiences and we forget at those peak moments to put the logo or to put the call to action at the peak or at those end experiences where they scoop. And so that's the key. If you have science to give people a map, then you're not relying on the gut feel of your editor to make those decisions. Got it. Got it. Okay, thanks. Um, and and the, the second thing, kind of in a, in a completely different vein, is, you know, Paul hmm. Varillo, the, the, the sort of French theorist, talked about when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck, right? When you invent the plane, you also invent the plane crash. For all yeah. the good that stuff like this can do, there is at least equal potential for 
really bad usages. Can you talk a little bit, mm. not just about the ethics in from a philosophical perspective, but what you and your organization are specifically doing to try and keep this out of the hands of people who uh, would find lots of, of awful uses for it? Such an interesting question, because you're absolutely right. You know, here's what we've found. Um, let's take a training example. We have um, one customer who uses us for sales training today. And in the first hour of sales training, what they've discovered is that in the first 10 minutes measuring immersion, they can identify who their top 20% salespeople are going to be for the next year. In 10, the first 10 minutes of employment, we can identify that. That's insane. It's, and it's super cool for that company to be able to know that, to double down, to help those people become incredibly effective. Now, the flip side, the plane crash of that is that they could also look at the bottom 10% and say, I'm going to fire you before you've said one word in this meeting. And that's the danger. And so what we've said and the way we coach our companies today, our customers today, is that instead of using those, that neurological frustration as a way to, um, to remove the challenge, it means that you now have to communicate with that bottom 10% in a different way. You need to move them into the top 20% because they're different style learners, which you never would have known before. There is a way to use this platform out of love, and there is a way to use this platform out of fear. We believe, especially in the early days, that we need to focus on companies that are committed to using it out of love. But I'll be honest, I don't know that there's a great way to prevent people from using it out of fear. Interesting. Got a couple more questions. Let's keep going. Uh, Conrad, yeah. are you uh, off mute? Can you guys hear me now? Now, yes. Yeah, sounds Sorry great. About that. Um, Scott, really interesting point. Um, I think the technology is fantastic. I totally agree with Rick where there is sort of the um, virtues and vices of, of this kind of tool. I think what I'm really excited about as a founder who's really focused on self-awareness is that um, I think it's spectacular to use this kind of information for oneself. If you were to kind of go through hmm. your day and go through your life and so and suddenly say, well, what am I lying about myself when it comes to what experiences I'm enjoying or hating yeah. or, or frustrated yeah. with and why? I think just, I think the really important thing that I got out of your um, both your movie example as well as when you were trying to showcase like, oh, well, what would happen in those 15 minutes into your presentation where you had that little emotional frustration, seeing side by side this data and the actual event in time to the degree of detail where you can where you can literally like rewind yourself and place yourself right back in that seat where you were in that point in 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 time i think that's so critical um yeah. and incredibly excitable and i think to kind of top it off on the ethical side i am really curious to see like how there is there is certainly the 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 um, the people who manufacture the products and services for the users and the users themselves and it's the users whose data yeah is inciting those products and services to be created better. Um, I think it's really, really important for the user to be just as aware of that data and how it's mm -hmm. being used for their own self-awareness as well as for their understanding that the products and services being used for them are being designed toward those, those sort of behavioral love, um, that behavioral yeah. attraction. My head went to food yeah. engineering. I thought, you know, we've we've incentivized people to eat crap for the last several years. Yes. Like, is this another opportunity for that? Yeah, Conrad, really great points. A couple of stories. First, um, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, we did a, a long-term project with Zappos, the Amazon company sells shoes, right? And they are big believers in love. And when they saw our platform for the first time, they wanted to figure out what was it over the course of the day that their employees loved to do and what were the things that they hated? And let's help them do more of the stuff they love and less of the things they hate. Because over time, I bet we could find employees that love doing the stuff that other people hate. And so 
Uh, we did a long-term project with them, and when they set up the platform, we had a system that sent a text message. Whenever somebody went really high with immersion over a, a period of time, we'd say, hey, what were you doing for the last 10 minutes? And then when somebody went really low, we would say, hey, what you been doing the last 15 minutes? And we tracked that over 90 days and built this model for um, – employee engagement to help them figure out the ways to best use the talent that they have inside the building. It was incredibly fascinating. Here's the thing. Zappos is a very unique company. And so when we've talked about this platform in other parts of Amazon or other parts, other companies around the world, we get a lot of pushback on the creepiness factor. So there is a thing there we have to be careful of. And so I think for certain organizations, this is incredibly powerful. For others, it might feel a little too creepy. There is a very large technology company today um, based in Silicon Valley. And we, starting on Monday, are going to measure every single team meeting that they have across their five HQs, 89,000 meetings a year because they know that psychological safety is the number one predictor of team success, and we'll be able to measure yeah. this and predict their ability to hit their KPIs long before they've written a single line of code. Have you, I'm sorry to interject here, have you read yeah. um, Ray Dalio's principles? Are you familiar with how he describes yeah. in his book the process that, he, that Bridgewater goes through with, with self-awareness and self-assessment? Uh, I think yeah. if you guys walked in there, you would probably help them realize some of their own biases when they do that, that kind of analysis. I think you're right. I think you're right. Interesting guy. I'm not sure that his model applies beyond his company, but boy, it's really fascinating stuff. There's also a ton of things around personal stuff that we talked about here, Conrad, where um, if you knew this stuff about yourself, if you could measure it personally, there might be something fascinating you could learn outside of a corporate environment. Um, I know that our head of sales does an immersion event every time he golfs. And we've had uh, um, sports uh, athletes use immersion to measure um, what's happening on the ski slope or what's happening in their sport of choice. Um, and there's some fascinating things that they're learning, um, things that I'm not uh, privy to share just yet. It seems like following that, it seems like your business model is, most, is mostly B2B at the moment. Are you considering kind of a B2C thing, direct to consumer? I'm not. Um, I think we were talking about it earlier, Don. I think consumers are weird. I, I don't understand consumers at all. Um, I understand businesses and we know that we can build a pretty compelling use case around decisions that are very expensive if you get them wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna start there and we'll build the business in that way. Now over time, we believe that there is a long tail to small and medium-sized businesses where neuroscience is really compelling. So think of it as um, small film produ production or small edit houses or ad agencies or startups that want to perfect their pitch and being able to have neuroscience in real time uh, and that immediate feedback. There should be a platform like this for, you know, a hundred bucks a month that gives them neuroscience at mm -hmm. scale. We had a question from Francis. Um, can you come off mute, Francis? Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate your presentation, Scott. And so that's funny because you just said the answer to the question I had for small businesses. And uh, also, we do have a trailer where uh, our, our, I guess our passion is about resilience. And so there's a documentary that we want to create on this. There's a trailer that's already done. So I was just thinking, wow, is, is, is it effective right now? So, uh, and there's also a lot of things that we want to do to help organizations to reawaken their inner power as well. So there's a lot of projects that I can see that it could work with, uh, either in terms of online training, either in terms of event that we create for organizations, uh, executives and leaders. So yeah, I guess, so you kind of answered it. It's, it's the pricing model will be around a hundred dollar per month. Uh, is that right? And the second question would be, is there any studies or areas you'd like to engage where you haven't even gathered the data yet? And you're thinking, well, maybe that could be a good partnership because we'd want to know 
like what's you know reinforce our our pitch with immersion in that category of business yeah thank you for that question um Let's start with the second question around what areas do we want to investigate? Um, that one's a little bit harder for us because, you know, the team is primarily made up of PhD neuroscientists who've spent 20 years doing the academic research. And so I've got, you know, academic papers coming out my ears. And, um, you know, I show up as the money business guy. And so for me, I want to find ways to help double down on economic value for the company today and not academic research. That said, there may be something that you're thinking about that is um, really fascinating and unique. So if you have an idea, I'd love to hear about it, um, but it's going to be a tough sell to get me to focus on the academic side of it. Um, if we can tie it to a customer, then I'm all in. On the small business model, um, 100 bucks is an example. We're pretty reasonably priced today for people that are um, making really hard decisions. Um, think of it as you know, 5,000 bucks on a SaaS model um, to be able to jump in. But for long tail, you know, there's gonna be a lower cost model eventually. But I so can't sorry, promise Scott, you when. I think it kind of cut down, like when you were talking about the pricing, so I missed the last part. I don't know if it happened only to me, but it was just kind of a, so what did you, can you repeat what you just said? It's something, it's a feature of my iPhone and Zoom that whenever I talk pricing, it cuts out. It, uh, <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> Hold on. Let me check my immersion on that one. That was a good one, right? Uh, okay. So, um, yeah. So right today, because we sell as a, an enterprise SaaS subscription, it's about $5,000 a month, which is still within the realm of people who are making very tough uh, decisions. And it's, you know, it's month to month, you could turn it on for a month and then turn it off again. Um, you compare that to the cost of doing a true neuroscience study from someone like a Nielsen or anybody else, and they're gonna charge you anywhere from 30 to $100,000 for one answer. And for that $5,000 with me, you could run, you know, a thousand studies every single hour for a month. Um, so the price per prediction comes down to almost nothing. But the long tail, eventually we're going to get to this small business model, this agency model that would be a much lower cost uh, to help really democratize neuroscience uh, much broader. I just can't tell you when that's going to come out. Okay, and last question is how do we best engage? Do we reach uh, you or uh, other people in your team to uh, kind of un uncover the, these opportunities? Yeah, you can always drop me an email and if I can't uh, take them, I'm happy to move it on to someone on our team. You could go to getimmersion.com and just sign up for a, a live demo and you'll get somebody from my team who's uh, happy to walk you through um, this conversation. Thank you very much, Scott. My, my pleasure, Francis. We got a couple of questions lined up. Uh, Lawrence, you go first, and then Jose next. Uh, do you need uh, yours, your uh, software only, or uh, do you need to have your hardware as well? Meaning, mm. that, would you use uh, Thought Technologies instrumentation uh, on your software? Yeah, so we are entirely software based. We use the generic sensors in smartwatches that are already in the field today, or the sensors that are already deployed in, um, you know, fitness running sensors like the Scotia or Wahoo. We have all of our smarts in the cloud. And so there is a lot of interesting conversations that we're having now about how do we leverage other people's sensor platforms, whether it's a uh, fancy new headset or fancy new uh, head mounted display. As long as we can capture the unique data we need to get in between those heartbeats, then we can provide real time immersion um, as an add on to other people's sensor platforms. Because uh, we make uh, one to 10 channels and you can put four instruments together so you can get up to 40 channels of, of all very interesting of nine, nine different psychophysiological measures. Including very AD, interesting uh, hemo electroencephalography, which is the last one we added. Yeah, 
Well, we should talk more. I'd love to learn more about the platform. At Thought Technology, uh, do reach out. Lawrence at thoughttechnology.com and uh, be happy to have a chat. Uh, we make a, a, a small four channel system, which uh, is uh, TPS, temperature pulse and skin conductance. And it also has respiration. Yeah, I, you know, I dropped, uh, uh, I dropped Scott's email. Offline on that. Sorry, oh, thanks, Scott. Tom. I dropped your email into the yeah. chat so everybody can see that. Yeah, thanks, let's follow up. You know, our team has done so much research on what's actually predictive of future economic behavior. And that's what's unique about this platform. Most academic research, and my apologies to any of you on the call today, um, people go down a path because that's the tool they have in their lab today. They do MRI research because they have a giant fMRI machine. They do EEG because they have access to that. And then they start to figure out what could we do with that machine. Because we were funded by DARPA and the CIA, we had the ability to go the opposite direction and start with predictions as the outcome and then figure out how to measure it. And so we figured out that MRI doesn't really work for predictions in a repeatable fashion. That skin conductance only works for fight or flight, which is interesting but not important. That EEG only works if you put enough sensors on somebody's head. There, there are all these challenges in these different platforms and what Paul and the team figured out is a way to measure the aggregate network effect of brain state rather than um, these individual little pieces. And so Lawrence, I'm very interested to learn more about the platform, um, but the breadth of sensing isn't as important to us as our ability to find the one sensor that will help us predict economic behavior. Uh, love, to, love to chat. Yeah, let's do it. Exchange, Jose, you wanna go next? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So thank you, Scott. Uh, I think I got my question answered. So what you're measuring is a physiological um, metrics of, of the body. I guess the question is um, how sensitive is, you, is uh, the watch, the Apple watch during this measurement? And if you are exploring the possibility of doing those measurements remotely, so for instance, uh, having a group of people, uh, are you able to target um, individuals or you measure the group effect or how, how do you do that? Yeah, let's start with the individual versus group. Um, we know from you know, power laws and statistics that about 35 people, 35 brains will give us a predictive repeatable answer on, on a single experience. Now, when we talk to a um, uh, an ad group at a movie studio, right? the movie trailer people, they're going to have different audiences that they want to try to target. And so think of it as 35 human brains per market segment that you really want to identify and, and uh, um, pick out. So that's, you know, in the group averaging to try to get a go, no go signal or identify market segments that might be profitable for an enterprise when you start to get into the individual effects of immersion then obviously we can drill down and you know one to one is really interesting but you want more time because there is no way to know that my immersion uh, went low in that little 15 minutes in here either because of the conversation we were having or because my kids are just on the other side of the door right here and i can hear them listening to youtube right now and that always makes me nervous with my eight-year-old little girl. And so who knows what was really the driver of that brain state, right? So you can measure other things alongside, um, uh, eye tracking, things of that nature to help narrow in on it. But even then, you know, there's lots of stimulus that's happening and your brain is absorbing lots of different things. And then uh, Jose, you had one other part of your question, which was, oh, I, I lost it now. Uh, hi, are you able to um, measure somebody from a distance? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's the power of the watch, right? So, without, um, excuse me, without the watch, without a watch, so no sensor. 
Yeah, concept no, no, we, system that you can, uh, I don't know, use a camera for temperature or, or some other thing to care. We need a little bit more sensitivity. Um, there is some technology that's come out with RF capabilities that I was working with at, uh, at my old um, job that allowed you to get some heart rate measurements um, using RF technology. But frankly, it wasn't good enough, um, and it, it really only worked if somebody was sitting still. So you could find out if somebody's heart was beating if they were sitting on the couch watching television, but uh, you know, if they're wandering around the room or they're standing like I am here or leaning into a conversation, um, it just didn't give you enough um, uh, fidelity. Thank you. Um, these are such great questions. Wow, this is fun. Yeah, yeah this is, uh, I, well, I, I kind of promised that. So uh, I, I knew I could back it up. Um, so thanks everybody for those questions. W one kind of related to what you were just talking about, um, just because with TransTech, we had seen some presentations at the conference last year of other metrics of uh, behavioral states using kind of common technology. And one of them was sort of like uh, computer keystroke measurement like the, the interface with the computer itself and maybe with the phone too, but not a specific mm -hmm. physiological thing, but behaviorally, the, the kind of the intensity of the uh, typing and I mean, there were literally kind of things like that. Have you- uh, Rage you clicking. Yeah, 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 yeah sure, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a great company down in Colorado Springs called the Quantum Metric that has the ability to measure um, rage clicks in shopping carts for online companies, and they can use that to help predict behavior and improve um, funnel metrics for shopping carts. Yeah. Cool. I think just kind of related to Jose's question, if you know, I mean, Apple Watch is a pretty good universe, but it's not universal either. Um, so. Yeah, that's right. Um, we know that 30% of humans today have a smartwatch that we support. Um, and that will continue to grow. I don't need that many. That's the beauty of neuroscience. Because I'm capturing millisecond level detail, you know, uh, a 30 second commercial spot gives me one human times a thousand times 30 data points. And that's way more than you'd ever get with a survey or a questionnaire or dial testing or anything else. Um, any other questions from the group before we close? Just, I, I just uh, the other thing, Scott, it occurred to me that um, actually our last presentation, our last webinar was from uh, Gregory at Okaya, Okaya, which is a local company and they use computer vision. So they actually, it's facial recognition technology to work on, on kind of a wellness application. Yeah. yeah. So many interesting things happening in this space right now. Um, for all of you that are building companies or working with this technology, thank you. And again, if there's ever anything that, uh, that I can do to help or, or my team can do to help, please feel free to reach out. Um, we want to help build this community of people focused on neuroscience um, for the greater good, right? To find ways to predict and measure love and uh, and democratize neuroscience for the world. Great, great closing. Thank you, Scott, for your for your presentation. It's very awesome. Uh, by My the way, pleasure. people should people should know Scott's also helping with the TransTech Boulder community and getting us going and help, very helpful advice from him. So appreciate that. Thank you all for calling in today and or finding your way to the call. So always an adventure with Zoom, but um, thanks everybody, and we'll uh, see you next time. Take care. Thanks everyone.